Wouldn't it be crazy if someone spent their free time coding an ELO engine for Formula 1 to once and for all answer the question, who's the greatest of all time? I hope you answered no, because that's exactly what I've done. If you watched my last video, you will know I've already spent months going through every result in Formula 1, tracking every teammate head to head, and plotting this monstrosity of a graph which shows every time someone beats someone else in equal machinery. Across all the seasons they were teammates, Nico, but that graph doesn't really give us any nuance. It doesn't show the difference between a close victory and an absolute trampling, which is all vital information if we're going to track down the greatest of all time. Which is why I had another idea. What if Formula One had an ELO system like chess? If we can make one, then every driver will just have a nice little number next to their name and we can just look at the biggest number of all time. It's easy, but how is this going to work? Like last time, drivers are going to gain and lose points based on their performance against their teammate. Because if we do anything else, then we're also ranking the cars. And I don't want to know which car is the best. I already know which car is the best. It's the Tyrrell P34. It has the most wheels, therefore it's the best. No, we're going to create a system that shifts drivers' ratings up or down depending on their performance against their teammates. Finish P19 in a race? That's not good. Finish P19 when your teammate's P20? You're onto something. Basically, this system should show us which drivers are the best at consistently demolishing their teammates, because that sounds like GOAT behavior to me. As of any ELO system, if you beat someone who is much higher rated than you, you gain a lot of points. On the flip side, if someone higher rated than you beats you, you don't lose that many points, because that's what everyone expected to happen. Sounds like the perfect way to rank everyone, right? Cool. Now we just need to make this thing work. The first thing we have to do is write down all the equations that make an ELO system function. I have no idea what those are. ELO engine. Okay, so I did some research and we have to use this formula. It looks scary, but we got this. What this says is that after each race, a driver's new rating is their old rating plus their winnings from that race. Your winnings are based on a pot system, kind of like poker. Each driver throws in an amount of points, their ante, shown by these equations, which is determined by their current ELO. The higher rated driver throws in more, the lower rated driver throws in less. The bigger the rating difference, the bigger the difference in antes. Underdogs pay less, established greats pay lots. The S in this equation is just your result. So a win is one, a draw is half, and a loss is zero. If you lose, you just lose the ante that you wagered. If you win, you get one minus your ante, and if you draw, well, it's half minus it. So you could go up or down, depending on who you're facing. The final thing here is this K, which is just a multiplier to spread the rating out. If we left this at one, then each race people would gain like 0.5, which sounds kind of boring to me. We can set this to anything, really. You'll notice that chess.com, the most popular chess platform, uses a K of 16 for regular players, which is why your rating goes up or down by about eight each time you play. For F1, we're gonna set this to 32, which means the maximum win or loss from each race is 32, but more realistically, it's gonna be about 16 every race. We're also gonna say that rookies always join Formula One with 1,000 ELO, it's just a nice round hole number. It doesn't really matter as long as it's always the same. The ratings will spread out from there. And that's it. The maths is sorted. It's not that hard, really. Now we just need the data to work off. Basically, I just need a big spreadsheet with every result from every race ever. Unsurprisingly, that's quite a lot of results. Funnily enough, I'm not actually crazy enough to write all of that down. However, some of you are. This mad lad, Vapani, has uploaded exactly that onto Kaggle and made it free to use for anyone who wants to. That's mad. Vapani, you're the real MVP. Cool, we've got it all in Excel. Time to write some code. Cue the exciting Hollywood coding montage. Couple hours later, and here we go. Some lovely VBA script to run through Excel. Not gonna read this whole thing, but basically, the script looks at each driver in a race, looks at which team they're on, looks at who their teammate is, and then looks at who finished higher. 
It then works out their new ratings based on the equations from before and writes them all into this big table here. It repeats that for every driver who's in that race, and then everyone who's not in that race just carries over their reload from the previous week. We repeat that for every race ever, and that's it. That's an ELO engine. Any questions? Hi there, yeah, Mr. V, Mr. V's Garage. What do you do if there's more than two teammates? What? Okay, so it turns out teams haven't always entered two drivers into a race. There's obviously lots of times when there's only one driver on a team, but that's simple. Can't win or lose your teammate if you don't have a teammate your points stay the same, but there are some cases where teams have more than two teammates. Firstly, we should look and see the most number of teammates in a single race. What could it be? 35. 35? So apparently, in the 1954 Indy 500, Curtis Craft Offenhauser have 35 entrants listed on the result sheet. What's even weirder is they only have 21 cars in the race. How did they manage this? Well, they had lots of cars, and also lots of these cars had people swapping in and out of them partway through the race to carry on driving from their teammate. Therefore, 35 drivers in total. I've got a simple solution for this. Any Indy 500 driver is not gonna be the GOAT in Formula 1, so we don't need to worry about it too much. I've deleted all 11 instances of the Indy 500, which were part of the F1 Championship. What does this leave us with now? What is the most teammates in a single team, in a single race? 15. How are there 15 Maseratis in the 1955 Argentine Grand Prix? How? I've edited the code. Basically, only one driver will gain points and all the others on the team, even if that is 14 people, will lose points. If you're not first, you're last and all that jazz. Realistically, the code now can handle any number of teammates, so I could add the Indy 500 back in. I'm not going to. I've also added two different ways of calculating the total pool of points for a team, considering we have teams with different numbers now, which we can swap between to see which one gives the best results. Method one is like before, where all the bets in the team add up to 32, but if there's more teammates, this obviously means that each person is putting in less. Or we have method two, where we use this table to look up the total points in a team. If you have a larger team, there's more points in total. This does mean that the winner will gain a lot, but beating two teammates is harder than beating one, so I would say that sounds fair. Right, so now the code looks at a teammate and looks at all their other teammates and works out everyone's ratings based on that. Any other questions? Hi, yeah, what if a driver finishes a race more than once? What? So apparently there are some races, including the 1955 Argentine Grand Prix, where some people show up on the classified sheet more than once. F1 classifications, as it turns out, are based on cars, not people. A car wins the race, not a driver. Apparently the race was so hot in Argentina in 1955 that multiple cars and multiple drivers retired. However, when some of the drivers retired, their teammates jumped into their cars, including people who were already driving in other cars but were just further back in the race. How does that work? I don't know, but here it is. This leads to a bizarre scenario where three people finished second and three people finished third. And two of them were the same people. Anyway, what do we do if someone shows up on the score sheet more than once? Ignore it. Basically. The way the script works is from top to bottom, and because the results are laid out with the best ones first, it's going to count every driver's best result. If your best result is also the best one of your entire team, you still win. To be fair, if you manage to drive one car, stop, get out, get in another car, and still beat all your teammates, fair enough, you deserve those points. Alright, are we done with the code? Any other technicalities that someone wants to bring up and ruin my day? What if a driver drove for multiple teams in a weekend? Oh, come on! Ugh. Apparently, there's a couple times this has happened. Most recently, it's a 1978 Italian Grand Prix. Harold Ertel turned up and tried to pre-qualify with the Ensign team. He failed. He then somehow convinced his mates of the ATS team to let him drive one of their cars in qualifying. 
he also failed to qualify. Cases like this have happened several times over the years, but again, they're rare enough that I'm just going to ignore them. The way the system works, Harold Ertl will actually gain ELO for this race because he was the best finishing ATS car. However, spoiler alert, Harold Ertl is not the GOAT of Formula 1. Don't even need to run it to tell you that. And therefore, it doesn't matter too much. Right! The code is done! No more questions. We are going to run this now, okay? Cool. Let's do it. Kind of have to wait for a second for it to calculate everything, you know, just takes a minute. Oh, it's done. Cool. Awesome. This first run was done using the weighted team points, depending on team size. I've also edited the code so that after each race, it prints out the highest ever ELO in the history of the sport, which we can read down the list and see as the lead changes over time. Let's take a look at this thing, see who's the coat. Also, at this point, I should add, the data I have goes up to the Belgian Grand Prix 2023 because I started doing this a while ago. Deal with it. So let's see. After 73 and a half years of Formula One, the highest rating ever achieved was 1,577 set by Juan Manuel Fangio in 1958. Really? If we take a look at the top 10 career peak ELOs with this method, we can see this definitely skews towards early Formula One, particularly people with large team sizes. The most notable exception here is obviously Alonso in third, but he is still 168 points behind Fangio, which is a lot. This made me think that maybe the weighted team score, depending on size, is a little bit generous. If we look, we see that Fangio had this meteoric rise to the top, but this is mainly because he had some races where he was gaining 50 points every race. I mean, he still had to win those races and also keep winning to hold on to those points, but still, I think I might have broken it slightly. Let's try with the whole team score always set to 32, see how that changes things. I ran the code again, and as I looked down the output log, I started to think maybe Fangio was just the greatest. He retired in 1958, and his record of 1404 just sat there at the top of the mountain, untouched for decades. It truly seemed like the OG goat might just be the forever goat. But then, in 2014, one pesky Spanish man dared to dream at the German Grand Prix by dragging his underpowered Ferrari to fifth. Fernando Alonso scrapes five points from teammate Kimi Raikkonen and makes his way to 1,408, the greatest of all time. He did then also beat Raikkonen again in Hungary one week later to go to 1412 and never got that high again. And neither did anyone else. So, um, Fernando Alonso is the GOAT, I suppose. There we go. He is a very worthy candidate. Two-time world champion, almost a five-time world champion, only ever beaten in equal machinery by Esteban Ocon, but also, I'm going to choose to ignore that, one of the youngest to ever do it at the time he joined the sport. Now, the driver with the most races ever. Still rapid after 22 years. Yeah, I'm not upset with this result, I have to say. For those curious, these are the top peak career elos in this system. Alonso sits ahead of Fangio, and in third we have Button, who basically got there because he gained an enormous number of points off the highly rated Alonso when they were teammates in 2015. Interestingly, in fourth we have Max on his current ELO, or rather his ELO after Belgium 2023. By the start of the US Grand Prix weekend, which is when I'm recording this, he has actually now got to basically level with Button in third, 1344. He's gaining about six points per win off Perez, and so if Red Bull keeps Perez for next year, and if current form continues, in theory, Max could be the highest rated driver ever by the mid-season break, 2024. This is how the 2023 season looks so far. Max came into the season the highest rated after spending all of last year just demolishing Perez. Perez did obviously beat Max in a couple of races earlier on this season, and because Max has so many points compared to Perez, every time that happens, Perez takes an absolute load off of Max. Should I rephrase that sentence? The top half of this thing looks pretty realistic. Hamilton is on good form, Albon on a banger, Alonso, Norris also on good form, but as we look further down these rankings, we start to realize some of the problems here. 
the most shocking rating for me is Piastri down here on 989 after Spa, 11 points below where he started the season. And this one really highlights the problems with this system. Because in one season you only have one teammate, normally, you can only gain or lose points against them. If you have a great season, but your teammate also has a great season, really, that just cancels each other out and you don't actually really gain anything. The way that you get ahead in this system is by having lots of different teammates, preferably all highly rated ones at the time you join the same team, and then absolutely demolishing each of them before moving on to the next. We have to remember also that Formula 1 really doesn't have that many matches compared to chess or esports or anything else that uses an ELO type system. The reason our highest ever ELOs are so low compared to greatest of all time chess ratings is because there's just not enough Formula 1. And then also, Formula 1 is just a bit more nuanced than something like chess. Does coming second in Formula 1 mean you're bad? No, that's fantastic. That's still a podium. Does coming second if your teammate comes first mean you're bad? Also no, but it depends, I suppose. This is not a perfect system for Formula 1. It's interesting, but it would need some other information added to make it more accurate and more true to real life performance. Maybe some sort of bonus points up or down depending on race result, quality result, average lap pace in a race, that kind of thing. You could tweak this, add more things into it, develop it to make it a more accurate representation of driver rating in the moment. You could, but I'm not going to. What I think this video and the previous one showed us is that no matter how we frame Formula 1, no matter which statistics and results we look at, it's always going to miss something out of the equation. Because everyone is in a different car, we will never really know who is putting in the most effort on any given Sunday. In my opinion, F1 should be about emotion. It should be about excitement. It is great to watch the sport and root for a single driver or a single team, and it feels fantastic when they do well on a Sunday. But at the same time, it's amazing just to watch the sport and witness these amazing feats of talent, both on the track and off it. I hope you enjoyed this video. This one, along with the one before, took a little while to put together. Thank you all so much for the support on this channel so far. All the comments, all of the support below the last few videos has just been amazing. We actually hit 10,000 subscribers just after the last video came out and then actually gained another couple of thousand since then. We're building something here on Mr. V's Garage and I'm not going to stop until I can commit myself full time to delivering you the most absurd, over the top F1 content possible. If you like this video, please let me know with a like down below. And if you have any crazy ideas or theories about the sport that you'd like to see put into practice by someone who is insane after doing these things for the last few months, let me know maybe I can make it happen. Subscribe so you don't miss the next video. And until that time, I've been Mr. V and I'll see you guys later.